Good segue, thank you. So the slides, we're basically the class today is discussing how evolution, what ha evolution has to do with the PowerPoint slides I tried to post for last class and then failed. So what's going on? We've been talking about how allele frequencies change over time. We did some red link simulations to try to figure out what population parameters, population size, selective pressures, and so forth can change how allele frequencies vary in a population over time. We've also been talking about simple traits versus complex traits most recently on Monday. So I'm trying to get you to think about is there a difference between the evolution and what happens when you're talking about a trait that's controlled by one gene and a trait that's controlled by two or more genes? So does that impact the, how easily, for example, a trait can evolve if it requires a specific genotype of two genes or three genes or four genes? What's the impact? What happens to the expected frequencies of genotypes at two loci? So this was the question that you're referring to, I think. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Okay. So I'm assuming that we have a population that's got two genes, gene A and gene B, and there are two alleles of each, allele 1 and allele 2. So you've got a third population where populations 1 and 2 have been hybridizing, making offspring that carry versions of alleles 1 and 2 at both the genes, A and B. So how do you do this prediction? There were a number of responses, by the way, a number of popular answers to this. So let me just quickly jot this down, just so you know what people thought about this. So in order of the frequency in which I saw these answers, we had 16th of the population, quarter of the population, 22%, which I didn't bother to figure out what fraction that was, and a half of the population. So the vast majority of people said it was a 16th of the population you'd expect to have A1 over A1 and B1 over B1 genotypes. This was a little bit different for the second genotype, which it should be, but the answers here were, in, again, in order of how frequently you answered these. Most people said an eighth, then second most popular was a quarter, then a half, then a sixteenth. So undoubtedly some of you were right. So how do you figure this out? What percentage of a population, if these are the allele frequencies, every allele, A1, A2, B1, B2, they're all present at 50% frequency? If you're an individual with this, this genotype, what's the probability that you happen to inherit an A1 allele? the frequency of that allele in the population. So it's 50%. So the probability of happening to have a parent whose gamete had an allele 1 is the same as the frequency of the allele, 50%. What's the probability of getting a second A1 from the second parent? It's the same. The frequency of that allele and then the frequency of B1s in the population are also 0.5, it says up there in the question. And all of these independent probabilities get multiplied together. So a half times a half times a half times a half. There's a half, a quarter, an eighth, the sixteenth. Or 6.25% of the population you'd expect to have that genotype the probability of getting every one of those four alleles is the same as their allele frequencies listed up here. You just multiply them together to figure out the fraction of the population that have that specific genotype. But, so here's the 
the essence of the question. That's the way to do it for this genotype. Does it work for the second genotype? So what's different about this first genotype and then the second one? Right, so, allele, so genotype one is homozygous. You have to get allele one from both parents to get this genotype. A1, that is. You have to get alleles A, B1 from both parents and their gametes to get this genotype as well. So when you look at the punnet square, what's the probability of getting that genotype? A1 over A1, B1 over B1. Where is it in the punnet square? So it's up here in the upper left. right? So there's 1 out of 16, 1 16th or 6.25% of the possible genotypes coming out of this breeding population that has that particular genotype. Somebody make the projector stop wiggling. So what's the probability of the next genotype? Where do those show up here? There's a, that one and that one, right? So there are two different ways to get those genotypes. So each one of those is a quarter represents, this one represents a quarter of the possible offspring, or sorry, a sixteenth. And so does this one. So together, those two genotypes can be made twice as frequently as this genotype, which only shows up in one of the 16 squares in the Punnett square. So what's the probability of being one of those two? One, this genotype is 6.25 plus 6.25, 12 and a half, or an eighth, two sixteenths right here of the offspring will have that genotype. That's what you'd expect. These are the expected values. So it really helps. You can do the math. You can just multiply the allele frequencies together. But you need to refer to the Punnett square to know how many different squares contain that 1 16th. Bless you. So yes, you have to use the Punnett square. It's important to look at the Punnett square and figure out how many of these squares contain the genotype that I or you are interested in figuring out. This is the F1 generation. This is, sure, this is an F1 generation. In theory, we're talking about a population, so there is no, this is not a cross. This is you go into nature and you look at a, you sample a bunch of individuals from a population of organisms. You want to know if you've measured the allele frequencies and they're all the same, A1, A2, B1, and B2, when you start picking individuals out of the population, how many different genotypes, which genotypes should you see and what frequency should they be in? So the whole reason that I'm talking about this is because I'm going to try to make a point about linkage disequilibrium, which is part of this chapter that we're covering. You should have read about it. Linkage disequilibrium has sort of a strange name. It's kind of like a double negative almost. So I'm making this point to talk about linkage equilibrium. Equilibrium, like Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, means that when you observe genotype frequencies, if you see, sorry, if you observe allele frequencies, then you should see these genotype frequencies. That would be linkage equilibrium. It means the population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. It's following Mendelian genetics. So if you go into a population and you measure allele frequencies and you draw the Punnett square, those, this tells you which genotypes you should see in the population and how frequently. If, you, if those match, then you're in linkage equilibrium. If they're different, you've got linkage disequilibrium. That means your population is doing something funny that you don't expect. Linkage disequilibrium usually means that evolution is happening. 
that there's some sort of selective process going on. It's boring <laughs> if you measure allele frequencies and you see what you expect. That means everything's happening the way Mendel would have predicted. You're in linkage equilibrium. The population seems like it's in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Nothing's happening. So it's more exciting when you measure allele frequencies and you calculate which genotypes you expect to see, and they don't match this Punnett square. So here's how to do that. We've got observed numbers of each of the nine possible genotypes. We wrote them all down from that Punnett square. Does anybody happen to remember what ratio those genotypes occur in? <laughs> you do not have to memorize this. But that's the relative frequency, 1 to 2 to 1 to 2 to crap. There you go. If I get a little bit closer to the Apple TV. <coughs> this is the observed, or the expected frequency ratio of all of those genotypes. So you should see twice as many of this genotype as you do of that genotype. The most frequent genotype is always going to be the heterozygote at every locus you're looking at. So in this case, the dihybrid. A1 over A2, B1 over B2, you expect four out of 16 or a quarter of the genotypes to have that genotype frequency, or that genotype. How many of you would love to do the chi-square test on this? We've got nine different genotypes. So we have to do observed minus expected squared over expected nine different times and add all of those together to figure out whether or not this population that we're looking at is meeting our expectations, if it's in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So what are the expected numbers? It's important. So we're not going to do the chi-square test, but I just want to look at this is what we predict to see. We've observed these genotype counts, numbers of individuals with nine different genotypes. Is that observed column a 1 to 2 to 1 to 2 to 4 to 2 to 1 to 2 to 1 ratio? Just by eye. So focus, what's the easiest way to do this by eye? We expect. Well, you're saying that the heterozygous would be more. Right. It's not, it's a So actually, we see nine observed out of 208 total individuals, nine are dihybrids. So that's an easy way to start. So look at which individual should have the highest representation of that particular genotype. In this case, we don't see that. So it's likely that this population is doing something interesting. We don't see a quarter of the total individuals, which would be what? Something like 50, about 50 out of 208, 52, mm -hmm. should be dihybrids, a quarter of the total number of individuals. Definitely not seeing that. So how do we get to the expected numbers then? 208 Right, so it should total 208, and if you divide that by 16, that gives you the ones, which is, what's the number? 13? OK. So every time there's a 1 in the ratio, we should observe 13. We expect to observe 13 individuals. The twos then are twice that, 26 individuals each. And that would make 452. So those are observed and expected numbers. So is this population doing something interesting to an evolutionary biologist, or is this boring as hell? Well, OK, it might be boring as hell regardless. But if you're an evo pretend you're an evolutionary biologist. So it's like the exact opposite of what you'd expect. Where does the observed and the expected number column differ the most? We've got the dihybrids. We observed nine. We expected 52. So OK, so homozygous eight, at the bottom. We observe 48. We expect 13. In the top, A1 over A1, B1 over B1. We observed 46. We expected, again, 13. 
The rest of these may be, who knows, statistically significantly different or not. They're more closely related, the observed and the expected numbers, than the pure homozygotes and the dihybrids. So interpret what the observed values could mean. Okay, so all alleles in this population over time will eventually become fixed or lost. Is that what's happening here? It feels like there's a homozygote advantage here, or at least a heterozygote disadvantage. Okay. So it seem, feels like, seems like, if you're homozygous at both loci, there are more of you in the population than we would have expected by chance. So 46 is bigger than 13, and 48 is bigger than 13. And then the opposite is true for the dihybrids. There are fewer dihybrids in the population than we would have expected, just based on the allele frequencies. So if we know that there are 50% of the individuals have allele 1, and 50% have allele A2, then we would have expected the expected number. So is it possible in this population that it's dihybrid disadvantage, that there's actually natural selection going on? Or it could be homozygous is beneficial. Or it could be that homozygous relative, so it's all relative. Either being homozygous for at both alleles, or both loci is beneficial, or being a heterozygote is detrimental, or both. But you wouldn't know this until you actually look at the expected number of individuals. Looking at the ratio is fine, but calculating the expected number and comparing the observed and the expected numbers with or without the chi-square test is how evolutionary biologists would figure out, yeah, is something interesting happening in this population that with respect, this is the critical part, with respect to genotype frequencies. That is, the number of individuals or the frequency of each of these nine genotypes. Because again, if you, go, if you actually calculate the allele frequencies from these numbers, you come up with something that's pretty close to this population still has about 50% of each of the alleles A1. So it's approximately this case still. So if you were just using Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, as your measure of is something interesting happening in this population, is, is natural selection acting, you'd probably conclude no. The allele frequencies are staying about the same in this population over generations. This act, you, just from the allele frequencies, you'd say, eh, everything's about the same. But when you go in and you look at the genotypes of individuals, you see that there are more of one type and less of another type. Suggests that natural selection might be acting. So that's really the take-home message from this whole example is natural selection can act without changing allele frequencies. Allele frequencies are important, but it's the genotypes that are really critical. It's the combinations of the alleles. And in this case, as was already pointed out, it looks like natural selection is acting to remove some genotypes from the population and favoring other genotypes in the population. But the allele frequencies are staying about the same. More simply put, can you come up with an extreme example that's a simple example of a population that has, let's just talk about one gene, gene D. So there are two alleles, allele 1 and allele 2, and they're each present at 50% allele frequency. Come up with an example where there's a cross, the allele frequency stays the same, but you don't see the genotypes you would expect. Mm 
So we want to keep the allele frequencies the same of all of the individuals in the population Let's see, there are 20 total individuals. How many D1 over D1s do you expect? That'd be 25%. Right, so it's... So the probability of getting that genotype is 25%. So 25% of the population size. Five. Five. So you expect to see five homozygotes for D1. That's 25%, 0.5 times 0.5 of 20. And the same is true for the D2 over D2. You'd expect to see five. And then the rest have to be homos or heterozygotes. So 10 plus 5 plus 5 gives you your 20 individuals. So that's what you'd expect in a population of 20 if you've got Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium in effect if everything's boring. How could we change these numbers of, gene of individuals with each of the genotypes, 5, 5, and 10? How can we change those to keep the allele frequency is the same, 50% D1s and 50% D2s, but show evidence that natural selection might be happening. <laughs> okay, so let's say there's zero heterozygotes. And then there are 10 of each homozygote. Okay, so then we've got 10 of each homozygote. So would everybody agree We've got the same population size and we've got the same allele frequencies. Half of the alleles are D1 and half are D2. Anybody disagree? Okay. So allele frequencies are still the same in this population. So if all you were measuring was allele frequencies, you'd say, ah, oh, nothing's happening populations in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. But when you go look at the genotypes, you see something different. You see there are no heterozygotes. That might tell you that selection's working against heterozygotes. And the reason why we keep saying it's natural selection is because the assumptions that are come along with Hardy-Weinberg is that there's no mutations occurring in random mating all that good stuff. Right. So I would have to tell you, if I was going to ask you this on an exam, for example, or if you were actually doing this in your studies, yeah, you'd have to demonstrate that all of the assumptions of Hardy-Weinberg expectation are true. You have a large population size, no migration, no selection. Well, we're talking about selection here. Large population size, no mutation, no migration. What's the other one? Random mating. But even after all that, in this case, you don't see allele frequencies change. That's what I'm trying to get across, which I'm about done flogging the dead horse. Any questions or concerns about this? So the point is we care about genotype frequencies as much as we care about allele frequencies. Allele frequencies tell us one thing, but genotype these tell us something else. The other thing I want to get to today is to talk really briefly about this alleles always fix exercise that was done with red links. So if some of you asked me for feedback on this, how well did you do? So I picked a couple of examples from students to show what all of you did, or some of you did anyway, to demonstrate to the class that every allele at some point in time will either fix or be lost in a population. So here's one example where we start with an initial frequency of 50%. And so all of the lines start there at generation zero, I don't know what generation zero means, generation one, let's say. <coughs> 
what happened to every population? It looks like they all went to zero at like one generation. Why is that, based on these parameters that are written up here? Because the selection strength is negative one, so they're all getting selected against, right? Right, so that's, it's two parts. That's part of it. So you both mentioned it. So one of them is selection strength. Minus one in this case means if you get this allele, you have zero fitness. Mm -hmm. Is it because there's a small population size? So that was going to be my question. So is it because it's a small population size, is it 600 a small population? So what, what does that have to be proportional to? The number of generations, right? So is the, the question is, is 600 generations small relative to the number of generations, sorry, 600 population size small compared to the number of generations we're looking at? And we've usually said that it's four times the number of generations is on average how long it takes alleles to either fix or be lost. So in this case, it went faster than that. So we're looking at 2,000 generations, the population size is 600, so that's like 3n, about. Three times the number of individuals in the population. So what made these alleles get lost so quickly from this population, aside from if you get the allele, you're dead? Then it also has to be dominance helps, too. So this means that you don't have to be recessive. You don't have to have both, both copies of your genome don't have to have this bad allele you get one version of this allele, then you see that selection strength. OK, so there are two scenarios that include allele 1. You, either have to, you need to be homozygous for allele 1 for there to be selection against. That would be recessive, right? If, if allele 1 has a recessive effect, you have to be homozygous for it to get selection strength of minus one working. If it's dominant, then all you have to do is inherit a single version of allele one to get that negative fitness effect. So when you set dominance to two, that means that, yes, allele one is dominant. So anybody who has even one version of this allele gets that negative one fitness value. So what would they do with the only homozygous A2 would actually Correct. So only individuals that had the original allele in the population, which we'll call A2, would be OK. And after one generation, everybody's got at least one copy of allele 1 through mating. And then it's all over for the population. Downhill from there. Well, it's, yeah, straight downhill from there. Other questions? So in this case, what I, would, I don't remember offhand, I apologize. If you go back to the Red Links website, I suggest everybody do this, because I was confused about what dominance of two meant. Because this is not normal genetic or scientific nomenclature for this. It's specific to this program. If I remember correctly, when you go onto Red Links, there's a little link underneath every one of those terms, or maybe each of those terms, like you could click on dominance, or there's a link underneath it that says click here for more information. It'll tell you how the program defines dominance. It'll say what a dominance of minus 1, 0, 1, and 2 means. So you can read about, and I don't think there was a dominance of 4, right? I think it was minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. And so you have to go, I don't remember offhand what they were, but you can go look them up. So what would happen if there was zero dominance? I think that was co-dominance or incomplete dominance. Yeah. I will do that next class. So we'll look at what it means when, when we vary that dominance value. The selection strength was easier. Minus one is bad, zero is neutral, one is very beneficial. So that was the scale for selection. Dominance, I'll look up and we'll talk. Okay. Thanks for asking. How do we know that A1 is the one that's the true? So by definition, just 
by definition of red links, this plot is looking at the frequency of allele A1. So red links is assuming that A1 is the new allele. And we'll just assume, we'll define that allele 2 was the pre-existing version of this gene. So therefore, we're just going to say, for the purposes of our class, that A2 was the original allele, and allele 1 arises at generation 0, and we see what happens to it over time. So what's the point? If you've got dominance and a gene's really bad, it gets lost in the population quickly. Big shock. So here we've got all the mutations starting at all the A1s and independent replicates and independent <coughs> runs of what happens to this mutation in the population over time. About half the time it gets lost, about half the time it gets fixed, which is what you expect. Review question. What's the probability of fixation of a mutation? It's Right, when it starts, it's 50%. It's the frequency of the allele in the population. So at this point, for example, that version of allele 1 in that simulation, in that trial or run of the program, has an 80% chance at that point of being fixed. Can you repeat the first Yes. So the probability of an allele of any mutation that's in a population going to fixation is its present frequency. So if it's already in, at 95% frequency, the probability that it's going to go to 100% probability is 95%. That is, when 19 out of 20 alleles in the population, or 95% of the alleles in the population are the allele you're looking at, what's the probability that that one last A2 is going to happen to be lost from the population? So the closer your allele gets to fixation or loss, the more likely it is it's going to go all the way. It would be like having a basketball team that's won 19 out of 20 games. And you're saying, what's the probability that they're going to win the 20th game? If they've got that good of a track record, it's pretty likely they're going to win again. Likewise, the same is true for loss. So once an allele gets down here to something like 10% frequency, the probability of it being lost going to 0% is 90%. Probability of getting lost is 90%. The probability of it going to fixation is 10%. So 10% probability of fixation. And so the difference between 100% and 10% is 90%, 90% chance of loss. And if it's in the middle or somewhere in the middle, it can go either way? Exactly. And that's what we're seeing here. So when you have simulations that start at 50% allele frequency, you expect about half the time, over infinite numbers of generations, that allele will either be fixed 50% of the time or lost the other 50%. And that basically is what happened here. Okay. So the probability of fixation is equal to the present allele frequency. Because, like, in here we're talking about um, an 80% chance of fixing, but, like, do we ever look at it as an 80% chance of being lost? So when there's an 80% chance of fixing, it's a good question. I'm glad you asked again. I want to make sure it's clear. So when there's an 80% chance of being fixed right here, what's the probability that it gets lost? 20%. 20%. So yeah, so you can, you can ask about either. Okay. It's totally fine. It's just 1 minus the probability of one thing, fixation or loss, equals the probability of the opposite of impact. <coughs> 
And it depends on the question, whether or not somebody is more interested in whether or not the allele fixes or gets lost. We've talked about like the main part of the population size, uh, the generation size. What about migration and mutation? Why are we not messing with those parameters? Oh dear. <laughs> why, are we, why have we not been talking about mutation and migration? Partly because they're not as well understood. Ecologists worry about that a lot because in natural populations, you do have to worry about the free, how mutations, how frequently mutations occur and whether or not migration is happening. It's hard to get solid estimates of how much migration there is in a population in nature. And that's why a lot of evolutionary theory and the rather simplified equations that are in the textbook come about is because we say, oh, well, let's just assume that there's no migration because we don't actually have a really good idea for a specific population of what number we would plug in there. Because it varies by which species and then which population of that species. It depends on what point in time you're looking at migration or, or not. And so these are important parameters to theoretical evolutionary biologists who make mathematical models and try to figure out what sort of parameters we need to have this sort of an effect on a population. But in reality, the actual how much migration is happening is really difficult to measure. Right, so for that uh, term, or that generalization that um, over time it will become fixed or lost in a population, if it's like four in, that's pretty much without the whole idea of migration and mutation, right? Correct. So that, that approximation of four times the number of the population size is about how long it will take to fix or lose an allele mm -hmm. is assuming that there's no migration, no mutation, random mating. we add in all those terms, then the math gets more complicated, which is fine, but not, well, not just for this class, but for this program, which is, a, I think, a useful program for doing this, but it's, ooh. Now, why does this graph look different than the previous graph? So all of the, it's like those big, long, plots that move all over the place have been smashed into the left half of this plot. We need to zoom in on the left half if we want to look at a lot of detail. So yeah, what? So in this case, it's probably because we're looking at a population size of 10, which means how many generations would we need to look on average to see fixation or loss? Four times n, or four times 10, in this case, four times the population size, or 40 generations, should be sufficient to see fixation or loss. And it, that's approximately what we see here. That over a very small number of generations, when you have a really small population size, an allele fixes or gets lost. What does this mean to the Fresno Zoo? Or to any zoo, for that matter? So you've got a, yeah, what about captive mating programs? So you've got small numbers of individuals living at zoos, small numbers of individual non-humans living at zoos. <laughs> well, to keep their, like, a genetic variation, don't they actually, like, mate with other animals at other zoos, and they make sure that they keep their genes going? Their right. Going. <laughs> so there's an issue, and that's why evolutionary biologists and evolutionary geneticists are concerned about this sort of thing, because... Sometimes it's bad to have too much genetic variation. So you can't cross lions and tigers or you make ligers and Napoleon Dynamite gets all excited. But, you know, and then they're sterile. So that's an example of outbreeding depression. You've got too much genetic variation and you cause your kids to be sick. And then, of course, what the zoos are most often trying to avoid is inbreeding depression, which is mating siblings together and siblings together for multiple generations. So the zoos, I was talking about this with the director of the Chaffee Zoo recently, they participate for, for the species they have, especially in low population sizes, they participate in basically genotyping, and they know the genotypes at certain loci of a lot of the animals, and they share that data with the zoos around the world, essentially. There's a big database. And then they use genetic algorithms basically to figure out which animals around the world of really low population size animals, tigers, for example, rhinoceri probably, should be mated together next. 
to keep genetic diversity going in this very small population size. And then they ship a tiger from China over here, or the Smithsonian Zoo, for example, is famous for borrowing pandas for breeding with the pandas that are in the Washington, D.C. Smithsonian zoos, and then they would send them, so they were on, the pandas were on loan to us for breeding, and then we send them back to China. And all of this population size particularly affects these sorts of processes. So we need to, captive breeding programs especially, care a lot about how mutations and random mating or non-random mating affect allele frequencies to try to maintain alleles without getting fixed or lost from the global population. Um, about the last slide, I'm sorry. Um, no. <laughs> okay. So yes, please, at some point today, turn in what you've got for your term paper. I'll give you as much feedback as I can, given the amount of time I have, and we'll move forward. Like yes, today. <laughs> Whatever you turn in today, I will comment on. Today ends at midnight. Yeah. You can turn in more if you've got more. I'm just trying to push. This is not for me. This is for, obviously, it's not for me. This is for you. I want you to have an opportunity to get feedback from me on what you've done so far. So I know on the syllabus it said introduction, but really it's draft, as much as you can. Now, I've got a question. We're going to end with this question. We'll come back next week. We're starting to talk about a totally different topic. So if population genetics is not your thing, then we've got something new for you. We've got cichlid fish and we've got doggies. We've got lots of variation that we see in dogs. We've got lots of variation we see in these cichlid fish. Different colors, different sizes, different mouth shapes in the fish, different behaviors in the dogs. They've been bred to be docile or aggressive. Go Bulldogs. <laughs> Who's, who, which school's mascot is the Shih Tzu? I mean, I, you know, like a little purse dog for your mascot. Which of these, do these fish or do these dogs represent species or populations? So in the fish, are those different populations or different species? Okay, so we've got species, species, it's hard. It's hard to say. Species, but... Okay. What about the dogs, though? Then maybe that's easier. The dogs, different species or different populations? <laughs> so much pressure. Okay, so, right, so let's define what a species is and a population is. What's, how do we define what a species is? Oh, man. Okay. So one of the ways that we dis distinguish different species is whether or not they're two members that we think are in different species, we mate them together, and you ask, are they able to have offspring or not? What about, so I heard a lot of people up front at least, though I'd like to hear from the back too, can you think of an example of dogs like those shown up there that are not able to produce offspring together? I suppose it depends on whether they're like physically breeding or if they're artificially inseminated. Ah. That could be an issue as well. It's like in nature, I'd imagine like a German Shepherd and a Chihuahua might have trouble. So yeah, let's say, is that an Irish Wolfhound maybe in that little, so let's see, let's see, that's a male and that's a female. Could there be some issues with reproduction even if those are members of the same species? Yeah, sure. Right. If the female's too small, Yeah, if the female's too small, then you're right. So this creates some issues with coming up with species concepts and species definitions. So what we've been talking about so far is the biological species concept. Can two individuals reproduce with each other and make offspring? Normally we say if they can't, they're members of two different species. 
But there's some issues like in dogs where that sort of concept of what you call a species and what you not call a species, kind of the rules break down a little bit. So when we get back together on Monday, we're going to talk more in detail about different types of species concepts and how those apply to these types of situations.